Israel has managed to capture the framing. You know, a framing is like a filter. So you can hear the same, the same fact and filter it in different ways. If I tell you that Israel has demolished 24,000 Palestinian homes in the occupied territories since 1967, most of you, all of you, I think, will say that's terrible. But if you're going through the filter where all these Arabs are terrorists, what, what, if I say this in Israel or towards a so-called pro-Israel crowd, the answer will be great. 24,000 less houses of terrorists. You know, in the assassination in Dubai a couple weeks ago, Zippy Livni, who is the leader of the largest party in Israel, said, why is everybody upset about that? What's wrong with one less terrorist in the world? So the language we use, the filters we use, the framings we use, absolutely determine how we approach a subject. And the problem is that everybody knows this from debate. The one that, and usually it's the first speaker, that captures, that captures the discussion, the one that defines the terms we use, the one that defines the issues, that sets the parameters of the discussion, usually wins. Because you've captured the logic of the discussion. The other side, I used to be in high school debate. I grew up in Minnesota. And in debate, if those of you that were in debate knew that the first side was the affirmative side, and the other side was the negative. Well, if we're in the negative all the time, and we're allowing the others to frame the debate, that's not a very strong position to be in. If you're in the negative, you you stumble, you stammer, you're trying to say things, um, you're trying to answer, rebut. It was always called rebuttal. We're rebutting what they're saying. And you come out defensive, you come out saying things you don't want to say, and you have no space for your own argument, for your own discussion. And of course, since the solutions flow out of the, out of the, out of the framing, the solutions of the, of, the, of the one that managed to frame the discussion are the ones that usually make sense to people. So that what we have, and what Israel has see succeeded in doing is capturing the framing. So far, I think it's changing, but it's not easy to change a framing because it's been so inculcated in us. I think the greatest piece of PR in history was the book Exodus by Leon Uris. I mean, all of us in, in my generation read the books of Exodus at the age of 15. It was translated into a hundred languages. And the Jews in the book, the Israelis, Ari ben Canaan and so on, were all, you know, they had names, they had stories, they had love affairs, they died. And the Arabs in the book had no names. They were marauders, they were gangs, they wore kafiyas around their faces, they were dark figures. And that book probably framed the image of Israel probably more than anything else. And our entire generation grew up with this exodus in mind. And then, of course, it became a movie with Paul Newman. You know, and Sal Minio as kind of a Mizrahi Jew. <laughs> with music by Harry Mancini, right? <laughs> Sung by Andy Williams. <laughs> and you all remember the song Exodus. It was number one on uh, the hit parade. You know, this land da, da, is mine. Da, da. God gave this land to me. Remember that? So... Israel became as American as apple pie. Well, that's a pretty strong thing to try to now go back and say apartheid and uh, Israel. You know, in other words, it's not just a matter of a discussion. It's a matter of really a process of reframing an issue in people's minds. So our job of reframing, I think, is really important, and it's a process. And we have to know how to do it. And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit tonight. Um, 
Because Israel has succeeded in framing the conflict in, a, in one sentence. Even Glenn Beck gets it. You know, it's simple, it's compelling. Basically, the Israeli framing says, Israel is a Western democracy. So already we know what side of the clash of civilizations we're on. Israel's a white democracy fighting Arab Muslim terrorism. That's it. That's enough. You got all the buzzwords in there. Of course, you don't even use the word occupation, so that never comes into the discussion. And everything gets reduced to terrorism. Well, try, if you try to argue out of that framing, you lose. You see, because you're being forced to use that terminology. So what I'd like to do is take a few minutes I, I can't do everything I'm supposed to do, present the, the present and talk about the future. And so I'm going to try, I'm going to focus, I'm going to cut things a little shorter and focus on this issue of reframing. And <clears throat> there's three parts of the framing. It has to do with how do we, well, the, um, all right, th th there's, a, there's a, a part that has to do with the conflict. How do we present the conflict? And flowing from that is how do we present the solution to the conflict? But before we get into a framing, there's an unspoken part that, that can't be said from the Israeli framing. Because if you say it and you're not Jewish, you'll be accused of anti-Semitism. So in other words, the very the underlying principles of Israeli policy, of Zionism, of Israeli policies until today. You can't understand where Israel's going unless you understand this unspoken part of the framing is something that we can't speak about in public because it sounds anti-Semitic. And that's why I have a certain privilege as an Israeli and a Jew to say things and to open the doors uh, for you guys. Because all they can call me is a self-hating Jew. And I can, I can live with that. My wife has called me worse things. <laughs> so essentially, this is, I'm telling you, you, you can't get it. You can't understand where Israel's going and why it's going there unless you understand this issue of exclusivity. And that is, you know, Israel presents itself as a Western democracy. It really tries to put itself almost into American terms. You know, we have pioneers, and we have settlements, right? Even the terminology that's used come, come you know, very, very close to American terminology. And of course, we're the only democracy in the Middle East. So that's the image, a Western sort of semi-American democracy in this uh, terrorist Middle East and so on. But in fact, Israel is not a democracy. The term we use in academic language is an ethnocracy. A democracy is when a country belongs to all its people. Demos means the people. Now we know in the United States, we know there's racism, we know there's discrimination, we know that this ideal uh, uh, concept isn't always reality, but it's the concept. The concept of the United States and other Western uh, democracies is that a country belongs to its citizens. But in Israel, the concept is the country belongs to one particular group. It's a Jewish country. And we call it in Israel a Jewish democracy, which is a little bit hard to reconcile. <laughs> you know, it's like saying, you know, there's a wasp democracy or something here. So that, so that it's an ethnocracy, and you can see it with the flag. I mean, what's the flag of Israel? It's the Star of David. Well, if we take away the occupied territories, about 30% of Israeli citizens are not Jewish. They're either Palestinian Arabs 
Or there, there's about 300,000 Russian immigrants who aren't Jewish, who have gotten citizenship in Israel for different reasons. There's foreign workers who have stayed. There's Ethiopians uh, uh, that have come uh, and have, uh, you know, uh, uh, I won't get into that whole thing. But, but the point is that the Israeli flag cuts out, excludes 30% of the Israeli citizenry. So that without getting into a long, I, don't, I can't get into a long lecture now, but in the 19th century, when nationalism was emerging in Europe, and you know the United States is a part of that, there were two major forms of nationalism. One was what you have here from Western Europe, what we, you might call a civil nationalism. In other words, really the idea that a country belongs to its citizens. If you've ever seen old movies about the French Revolution, they're all running around saying, citizen, citizen, hello, citizen. Citizen was this great new idea that emerged. In Eastern and Central Europe, it was a very different kind of nationalism, what we might call a tribal nationalism. In other words, Russia belonged to the Russians. The Jews lived for a thousand years in Russia and were never considered Russians. You know, there were actually two major national movements in Central and Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, it was pan-Slavism. So if you weren't a Slav, you were kind of excluded. And we see this with, with the Serbs, the whole concept of ethnic cleansing that comes out of the former Yugoslavia. And the other major nationalism was pan-Germanic. And we know where that led. So that these were, but nevertheless, these were the kinds of nationalisms from which Zionism comes from. Zionism comes out of Eastern and Central Europe. Eastern Europe was where the Jews lived, especially in Russia. And in Austria is where Theodor Herzl and some of the leaders of the Zionist movement came from. Well, when they began to develop a Jewish nationalism, the Zionist movement, they didn't jump to some Jeffersonian concept. They took the nationalisms that they knew. And therefore, when they brought it into Palestine, they brought this idea of exclusivity. Because this is what comes out of that tribal nationalism. And that is... And this is, again, the assumptions underlying Israel and Israeli policies. That the land of Israel... Now, just here, it's interesting. We don't talk really about the state of Israel. The, the most liberal newspaper that my son works for is called Haaretz, which means the land. In other words... In tribal nationalism, you think of pan-Germanic or pan-Slavic nationalism, it's not defined by a particular country. Pan-Germanic means the Germanic lands where the language is spoken. It's not confined by borders of states. The idea here is that, that the land of Israel is much wider than the state of Israel. The state of Israel is only on a portion of the land of Israel. And it's the land of Israel that we want to, to reclaim, right? And I'll tell you something else. It's, it's not really relevant in actual politics, but in the right wing in Israel, if you look at the, par, at the emblem of the Herut party, the Freedom Party that was Begin's party, it's, a major, it's still the major element of the Likud in Israel. If you look at the emblem, it's, it's Israel, the occupied territories, and Jordan. That's the land of Israel in the concept of the Likud party. And so what Netanyahu would say, and, and I've heard him say this, is that why is the world begrudging us? Now, language is very important in framing. We don't call it the West Bank. We call it Judea and Samaria. Samaria. 